Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Tiramisu Talk, where we're going to talk about the, story, uh, the power of stories and shared experiences. And to start this talk off in a little bit of a different way, we're going to give you a little bit of time to, to sign in and get comfortable. And then we're actually going to start off with a poem by Elisa Sales of Columbia University. And she is going to give us her interpretation of the power of stories and experiences in a second. And then we're going to go into our panel discussion. In the meantime, if you want to share in the chat where you're joining in from, then already do that and quickly introduce yourself if you want. And we'll start the video in a second. I am a junior in CC and I am representing Columbia Slam Poetry Club and this is my piece. The first time I watched Moana, I cried. I was lying in those fine movie theater recliners when it happened. Tears rolling like waves as Moana's grandma died. My silent sobs and a loud thumping of my heart. Moana's grandma reminiscent of my own. Strong, powerful, resilient. Grandma, Lola, Lola, Lola. My story begins long before my birth. My story begins with my family's history. My Lola, a quiet soul with 15 brothers and sisters, head heavy with dark curls and dreams left unfulfilled. Strong bones and skin, standing tall like a mountain when she married at 19. A college dropout at 20 to eventually care for six kids. A black veil solemnly covering dark eyes when her husband died at 42. She is where I have learned perseverance. I was raised by strong women. Their strength runs in my blood too. It shoots from my fingertips like sparks, pumps to my heart, courses through my veins. Imagine a widow with no college degree set on immigrating her children to the land of the free. Soft hands traded for Mars calluses as she cooked for nuns. Soft legs traded for steeled iron skin as a security guard. But with all the late nights and the sweat and the blood, she never traded her soft heart. And she gave her children a start to thrive in our land and provide for their own families. The second time I watched Moana, I cried. There is something so beautiful, the way Moana stood barefoot on a raft alone at sea, her voice calling out to a sky dotted with stars, long brown hair swaying in the wind. She asked, who am I? In that moment, I traced the lines on my palms and asked myself the same question. High school, I began to feel the weight of the world on my shoulders, drowning in a society that slapped me with, you're not good enough. Over time, I discovered confidence and encouragement, mapping sources of love and happiness as if I were raising my palm and high-fiving the sky, following the constellations of stars whose incandescent heat culminated into my own unwavering light. You know, the third time I watched Moana, I cried. Yes, I'm grateful to live in this country, but our so-called freedom, it lives on paper. And I await, I fight for the day that I see these words float from the parched tree in my hands and soak into our ground, breaking our shackled bonds so we can sing and shout for our freedom. I cried because I was represented. My culture, one of a seafaring nation, while not the same as this Disney characters, was seen. My voice was heard and I felt loved. Yet, so many other voices still drown. Our nation, where dark skin seems to call for arrest, where black men pulling out phones is an offense, where many queer children live in fear of classmates' fists and cutting words. This seems to be our America. But we 
our generation, our America. We are the youth that embrace every color imaginable and we are unafraid, diving into conversations and jumping into action to fight for our beliefs. Through all of our country's adversity, we rise. Thank you. So thank you so much, Elisa, for sharing this beautiful poem with us. That's a, we are very sad that you couldn't be with us today, uh, live in the session to, to actually talk about it. But um, I think it has been a really powerful introduction to the topic that we want to talk about today to start for uh, the power of stories and shared experiences. And therefore, now I want to go into introducing our panelists for today. We have Huyen Kiki Wu with us who is um, the founder of, of Try, Try for Kiki and is also a clinical social worker. And we have Jimmy Westerheim with us, who is the founder of The Human Aspect. Um, and I, in the context of sharing stories, I don't want to raise too many words about you, but I would love, I'd like you to introduce, introduce yourself and tell us something about yourself, starting with you, Kiki. Hi everyone, thank you so much, first of all, for just inviting me to this space. I think, I guess a little bit about me. My name is Kiki, I was born in Vietnam and I came to the United States about when I was 12 years old. I am a proud burn survivor, a complex trauma survivor in general and um, an immigrant to the United States. And yeah, I'm here to just share stories, but also learn from other people's stories and to just be in community with everybody. Thank you so much. And you, Jimmy? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm Jimmy Wester. I'm from, from Norway. And I'm, the, as you said, the founder of The Human Aspect, which is the life experience library. So it is then living off interviewing other people and lifting up the stories of other people. So the Life Experience Library consists of 650 people like Kiki, like myself, that have shared how they managed to deal with the toughest challenge that they faced in life and what they have learned. So you have these 650 30 to 60 minute interviews that are all available for free, of course, in, in the human aspect. And it makes it today the largest free available tool within mental health in the world and it's being used all over the world and i think we have interviewed people from 94 different uh, nationalities at the at the moment and in a lot of different languages but of course english being the main language and i'm a countryside uh, boy who came from a small small place and of course i have my own lived experience as well and quite a lot of traumatic uh, incidents, uh, maybe the biggest one being of being at the point where myself was uh, suicidal and had planned to to take my own life because feeling that was too difficult to to live. Luckily, of course, I'm still here. So I've been utilizing that experience uh, together with a passion for storytelling and then combined it in leading the team in the human aspect. And I'm looking forward to this conversation, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and we're all very happy that you're still here with us, obviously, uh, joining us in this talk today. Um, I think one thing that I find really powerful in the way that you both introduce yourselves, but also in, in the way that you are building up your work is really this coming up, uh, coming out with, with your stories and even the, the, the parts that other people would normally hide in, in a very outspoken way which is not something that people usually do most people are really looking for this perfect image that they are building for themselves and it takes quite a lot of courage to just go out and say this is me and and this is my background and this is my story how did you overcome that yourself and also how um are you working through that with um with the people that you interview um jimmy what, what does it take to overcome that courage I guess Kiki can answer the question first for, for yourself, and then I will jump in to ask to answer both for myself and for how we do it with interviewees as well. 
That's, that's definitely um, a tough question. Uh, and I try to think of when did I start like sharing my story? And I think for me growing up as a teenager, you know, trauma holds states in our body and all the emotions that stayed on my body when I was so young. And I couldn't, I felt that when I share my story, every time I share my story, I release the pain. And every time I release my emotion, I'm healing. And I think that was when, like, when I was in high school, I start to, to recognize that. And I start to recognize that the minute I start to open up, I feel better and other people start to be able to connect with their own experience and they start to explore and they start to like, okay, this is, you know, I might not have experienced the same thing that she has experienced, but the emotions that came up were similar. And I think that's the powerful piece of when I start sharing my story. And it made me feel like I can continue to do that because it's not just for me, it's for other people as well. You know, I think one of the okay. biggest moments for me was, of course, in general, to first reconcile with my own story. I think one of the first steps for a lot of us is, is realizing we have one. You know, uh, when we reach out to people and we ask them to share their story in, in the life experience library, a lot of people would, would normally say, you know, but I really haven't been through something. It's not been that bad, you know. I haven't been uh, in prison or anything, or you know, I haven't been tortured, or you know, we we dramatize and we kind of lift it up to kind of Hollywood level, right? If it isn't good enough for to be a Hollywood movie, it's 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 not a good enough story to tell. But what we have done and kind of was the main focus of my own journey and lesson was that. I always knew my entire life that other people talked about things when it was difficult because I was the hobby psychologist. I was the one who was close friend with others, you know, talked to them, gave them advice, but I didn't talk about it in my own life. I was always silent. I was raised to be, you know, big boys don't cry. I was raised in the sense that uh, you're supposed to be independent. Uh, you're supposed to take care of yourself. And complaining about things was never really seen as an option. And especially not being vulnerable as a man as well. So, you know, let's say, Kiki, you found out a lot longer <laughs> before me, to put it that way. I was, I was 27 when I was uh, living as an expat in Singapore. And I'd had quite a fascinating uh, journey. And I was uh, living as an expat then in Singapore. And I'd crushed my back. I had kind of shattered my vertebrae disc. And I was sitting in the hospital in Singapore when my journey of thinking about these things started. And on that point is the first time I started realizing that, number one, I'm not sharing things when it's difficult. Why am I not doing that? And I also started realizing that I don't really have anyone around me that I can talk about these things with because I am not comfortable opening up, even though others are with me. And then I, you know, quit shipping, went into Doctors Without Borders, and a very long story shorter, I again ended up facing quite a big traumatic event, living in Afghanistan, um, in a country that has gotten a lot of attention these days, and I was living there on, on one of the heights of a lot of the war as well going on, and we lost a lot of colleagues in the, in the bombing of Kunduz Hospital. So everybody I was working with was going through a huge traumatic event something that would be traumatic for anyone. And still we weren't talking about it. So I was again, now I couldn't let go of that question. Why are we not talking about things? And why are we not comfortable in sharing our story as something? Because when I came home, I had the same problem. I couldn't really talk about it. And that's when I realized that it's not the actual context of the story that it makes us human it is the emotional side. So why I called it the human aspect was that I couldn't really reconcile with the kind of the storyline of saying that we are made up of DNA and environment. It didn't make sense to me. I didn't either both look like or talk like or act like the ones in my family, aka my DNA. I did not feel like I was one of the people I grew up with. So the environment theory didn't really work out for me. But people that had gone through similar things, 
people that didn't have their biological father growing up, people who had a father who was an alcoholic, people who got bullied, some of the big traumas I've gone through, those people I connected with right away. It could be from anywhere in the world. I would connect in an instant. And then I started realizing that, hmm, maybe what makes us who we are is more the things we have gone through and what we have learned from it and how we have evolved through our challenges. So once I realized that, I also then realized for myself and accepted for myself that everyone has a story. The question is, what is your story? And who else can connect to it? Because when you remove the context and you start talking about the emotions that I felt, why didn't I want to live anymore? Those emotions are quite common. So even though someone else wasn't necessarily suicidal in it, someone else would have felt those feelings. They potentially maybe dealt a little bit better with it. And then suddenly even suicide becomes quite human and not so distant. And that would be the same for someone who would go through a refugee background, as you described as well, Kiki, you know, some of those things coming from another country with parents from another country, all of those things, when you describe the emotions of not feeling like you belong, now all of a sudden you and I would describe exactly the same thing, even though my parents are from Norway and we just moved from one part of the country to another. And that's why we felt we didn't fit in. So that's kind of how I started daring tell my story is the second I realized that someone else could have use for it. And that's exactly what we said when we went onto the streets because it was quite a fascinating concept. We went to the streets of Oslo and for the ones who haven't been in Norway, Norwegians are quite reserved. To get Norwegians to talk about anything is difficult. So we went to the streets with a name, a brand that no one had heard of. It was an Instagram account with one picture and two followers. It was me and my friend. <clears throat> and we were to ask them about their toughest challenge in life. Quite difficult topic. And with people we have never met in our life. So that was kind of the ultimate challenge. And what we saw after, the reason why we managed to get 30 people in those first uh, one and a half weeks when we interviewed is exactly that. We told them that what you have gone through and what you have learned is something that we will make available to the entire world so that other people who search for that challenge will see that video. So it's not going to be up there being compared with, you know, someone gone through a tough refugee background or torture or anything very traumatic. It's going to be seen by the ones who search for love sickness, um, back injury, depression. And then all of a sudden they said yes, even though maybe they were skeptical in the beginning. So I think that's kind of a very long answer, but that's kind of the core of, of why people do it. We got 650 people to talk about their toughest challenge in life, and some of it quite traumatic, and over 50% of them has never said about that challenge to any living human being. And suddenly they do it in full name on video for the world to see. And they even get tagged on social media. So it's quite impactful what Kiki said as well, that you realize that someone else can have use for what you have been through. It's both empowering for us and for them. But I must admit, the way that I'm talking about my you know, suicidal thoughts and all of those things, it's obviously taken training. So I don't want anyone watching now thinking that, you know, I just woke up one day and then I could talk about those things that, you know, naturally. That has taken uh, those five years that I've been working with this now, um, talking about it. So in the beginning, it was, it was difficult even to say the word suicidal because I was still a little bit embarrassed. And that went for all the other traumatic incidents as well. So you have to start somewhere. And then, of course, the mirror a best friend, you know, someone you trust is, is a good way to, to start. And then you don't have to be scared of not having all the words because that's kind of the point to just start talking and then slowly, slowly will develop a, a bigger emotional vocabulary to dare to, to share your story. Yeah, I love how, how both your answers are including those really important elements of starting just somewhere. And I think that's the, the most important thing is really just taking the first step. And that can often really start an avalanche of, of, of sharing. And I think the other thing is really the point of 
doing it for someone else and for for something that is that is more important and that is also even bigger than than yourself and so on that perspective um, do you have any points in in positive or or also negative experiences of what your your story what sharing your story has been bringing and reactions and and other people um, that 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 really stood out for you in any way Kiki? I think one of the positive um, reactions, I guess, for me was <clears throat> recently someone reaching out to me from an article I wrote and someone who just, you know, was burned um, recently two years and also a Vietnamese uh, woman. And there's a cultural aspect to it. We're not talking about mental health, but also being a female burn survivor is very difficult to talk about, um, especially with the standards of beauty and also going through that age of 20s, early 20s, where everybody's focused on, you know, getting to get a good job, you know, comparison yourself to other people's benchmark and journey. And so she reached out to me and she wrote me at, le at least, I think, like 15 paragraphs, 10 to 15 paragraphs, sharing everything and sharing about the emotions that came up, the shame that she felt. And it was also an experience where it was um, self-harm. And so there's just so much uh, to unpack for her and so much that she just needs someone who can relate to her cultural background. And it also made me realize like, this is also why I'm gonna become a medical, you know, um, a professional psychotherapist to do this work because not as a trauma survivor, but also someone in the mental health field, I can sense how people's thoughts can be distorted, how the, all the emotions, and oftentimes the things that prevent us from telling our stories are those emotions of shame and embarrassment. And to unpack those emotions takes quite some time. Like Jimmy mentioned, it didn't take me like next day to tell my story. You know, it took me 30 years later to be in public and wearing, you know, bikini in like Hawaii or going to places like this. Things that people often can do like easily without thinking. And for me, every day is a constant journey and a constant battle to remember that I can exist in this world authentically myself. I don't need to compare myself to anyone. And it's hard because that requires me to catch my own thoughts. And to also recognize that, like, I'm just living this this life, this temple that I have a second chance at uh, at life, and I think that's the piece there where I'm able to, you know, people, strangers out of nowhere, reach out to me and sharing how they connect to my story and how that's really helping them share things that they never shared before. As Jimmy mentioned, it's such a um, a powerful honor, like a powerful privilege for me to be in that position. And for negative wise, I think it's more of me, uh, me internalizing like, oh, I'm sharing too much. Cause I do acknowledge that like, there is a piece of trauma survivors where we either overshare or we do not share enough. So there's an aspect of that too. So I noted, noticed that when I was growing up, there are moments where I overshare because I want it to be heard so badly. And there are moments where I'm like, there are places and time for things. I think now as an adult and mental health professional, I know my space and time for this, a place that's safe and a place that people feel comfortable having uncomfortable conversations because not everybody is ready all the time to embrace your story. Not everybody is able to, to sit with those emotions and be able to hold it for you. So I think that's to acknowledge both sides is important. Acknowledging that not everybody has been through something and sometimes it just takes pure a while to 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 process things, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to be there for you. I think that's very important to acknowledge. But yeah, that's that's some a lot of thoughts, but that's if I have two cents. I think uh, kind of the first thing that comes to my mind that we have been discussing a lot, of course, is because we, we have a lot of people who are sharing stories that obviously involves other people as well, right? If you have been abused or 
if someone in your family was involved in your situation, or even for me, talking about a story where I'm saying that I was suicidal at the age of 13, obviously my mom watching that is not going to feel really good about herself as a mom, even though potentially she didn't do anything wrong. So there's a lot of aspects of a story that potentially could be hindering us of sharing it. So we have spent a little bit more than average time uh, reflecting over those topics, of course. Um, and one of the things that has always been important to me is for us all to start realizing that any story is our story. It is a subjective version of how we have lived the story. Of course, it is our responsibility to dare to have some reflection in that and maybe objectify, the, make it a little bit more objective, you know. But eventually, it is your story and your story to own. As long as you don't put a lot of victim energy in that, then there's nothing wrong with that story. Even though someone else might have a different version of it, it's still an authentic, real story. So an example was that when I was going to give out my own story, obviously, I, I told my mom and... I tried to, to explain to her and maybe prepare her a little because I knew that my story would get a little bit of extra attention since I was the one who started the organization. I knew that a lot of people would start talking about it. And she got stressed and came with some points back. That was fair points, but also mainly driven of, of fear, of the impression I said earlier that she was scared of the countryside of being stopped in the supermarket or you know looked upon as a bad mom because what of what happened so i had to allow her to stay in that a little and i also had to explain to her that this is my version of it that didn't have anything to do with you there you know the situational context of it and uh, i'm doing this because it's important to other people so i for me i'm willing to stand in it and i'm also willing to make a small sacrifice when it comes to also that potentially this will be a little bit tough on you. And, and that is something I expect from you as well to be able to stand in on it. But I also made some small changes because you had a couple of comments and I reflected on them and dared to allow her energy to come into it a little as well. And I removed some minor things, but it had nothing to do with the main context of the story. But it was small details that she felt something happened inside her on those and it wasn't relevant for, for the big picture. So that's the one side of it that potentially could be uh, a little bit challenging, but that I feel we should all dare to stand in because we shouldn't allow that to hinder us uh, to tell the story. But again, victim energy has never helped anyone long term. So being aware of it yourself and potentially, like Kiki said as well, to, to digest your own story and be able to tr process your traumatic uh, experiences before you go public and share your story that's of course important but talking to a friend completely different there shouldn't be any boundary of saying something to a friend because you should be safe and the same for a professional obviously where it's it's then of course uh, confidential so that shouldn't be a problem the other side of sharing a story how it could be part of our healing we have actually done some in, uh, internal research on that, and I was at, um, invited to TEDx, and of course in TEDx you can't just come talking about something you have done, you have to come with a thought or an idea or something that maybe is a little bit new. So then I said that what we have seen in the human aspect is that only 7% of the people we interviewed ask themselves ever the question, what did I learn from this challenge? Because we're so eager when we have overcome something to leave it, to run away from it, because we're, we're so tired of it. Our trauma, we don't want to see it again. Like you talked about your burn injuries as well, right? You wish you could just delete them from your mind and, and not, not deal with it anymore for most people when we are not comfortable in it yet. And then once you have started processing, what did I actually learn from this? Who am I now that I wouldn't be without this part of my story? And if you manage to find that, and use it for something, I see that people heal the last 20% is what I'm calling it. So I, my statement is that if you only carry a trauma and you try to suppress it and say that you have, you have dealt with it, I've gone to the psychologist, I've done my part, now moving on, then you will never fully heal. 
But if you utilize that story for something, it doesn't need to be, you know, the stereotypical that uh, you went through something traumatic uh, when you were younger in a foster care, for example, and now you work as a social worker to help other uh, foster children. That's a stereotypical example, right, of how you could use your experience. That is extremely useful. But the other one would be just be a volunteer, for example, in an organization. Uh, have a small blog or just support your family that is going through something uh, traumatic uh, like this. Then we see people heal that final part. And we also say that, you know, 20% of the healing also comes from storytelling. Because in telling your story over and over again, this is also research from, from group therapy, uh, is showing that people become more comfortable with the uncomfortable by talking about it and seeing that other people is not shocked. For example, if you go to group therapy with other, you know, uh, burn survivors, you will also see that they are talking about it. And when you are talking about it, they're not shocked because they have similar experiences. And suddenly you can stand a little bit stronger in it. So that's kind of what I see as, a, as the two positives and has really been true for me as well. Once I put it out there, it was much easier to talk about it after because I saw that people actually, a lot of people at least, uh, were very positive and said similar things as Kiki that uh, I get messages, you know, every week, sometimes every day uh, from people uh, that is saying that they connect with, with my story. And the most beautiful is I get messages from a lot of people who don't identify themselves with me from the characteristics I talked about earlier, environment or DNA. It's more that it can be from anywhere in the world, but they've gone through similar emotional journeys and they connect with what I'm saying. That's truly, truly motivating for me. And that's probably why I'm doing this <laughs> 200% still. And it's not a job, it's uh, definitely a life. So. I think that's the, the, your answers are extremely powerful. And I think the, the one question that I would want to ask you, um, Dale, before we go into, uh, into the, the audience questions as well, is um, you talked a lot about the positive aspects of sharing your story of um, basically the, the healing process and and of basically um, that also being beneficial for others is there ever a point when you felt or also people you work with felt a bit consumed by their stories and their stories alone because i think people tend to put a lot of labels on us when when they start hearing it and then at some point there is also this point where you're trying to overcome your 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 challenge and trying to build your personality apart from that challenge and and your life apart from that challenge does is it ever for you also a burden to to continue to talk about this and 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 how do you how you how do you deal with this situation thank you for that questions uh, think of it as a part of my identities right um, this is a term called intersectionality about how the different part of who you are makes up who you are. So the intersection of my identity as a trauma survivor, an immigrant, an orphan, as well as a young age of 18, all these identities and all those experiences shape who I am today. So, you know, it's more of like me figuring out and what I identify with and also acknowledging that emotion comes up you know, I struggle with my being a burn survivor, but I also struggle with other things. But also there's joy in all these experiences that I've been through. There's people that have been there for me. There's also the strengths that I acknowledge that I, um, the inner strengths that I've had to, to overcome all of that and all of that together at once. So for me, I think it's part of my identity now. So it's not like I can choose to turn off the switch. Every day I go outside in this world and this world sees me in a certain way. So for me, it's to reclaim that and to really write my own story and own that narrative. So it's, uh, I don't think of it as burden. I think of it as a privilege to have this identity and to walk through this world in this way because there's no one else like me and there's no one else like you or no one else like Jimmy. And so that's the beautiful piece of it. And I think sometimes is what I tell folks or I tell my clients is that when we've been through a trauma, a traumatic event, is that our body and mind are at two different places. Our body is at this place where we've just been hurt, like 
traumatized. So our body's in this, this place where it's trying to fight, freeze, or all these mode. That's our nervous system. And our mind is like, let me just get over this trauma. Let me move on. And that's not how it works. We got to separate. We got to really, really separate those and recognize that our body needs time to heal. It means you need to go back to the basics of just what do you need to tend to those wounds? Like, what do you need emotionally? What do you need mentally? What do you need physically to feel safe? And oftentimes we rush, we rush healing so much. And we also feel like, okay, if I do this, I'm going to be better. If I do this, I'm going to be feeling much better. But it's not like that. In life, we will always face some kind of things that, you know, is painful, right? And I think accepting that piece of life so that you can really see the other part of life as well, which is all the beautiful parts, the sunshine, the flowers, the plants I have, you know, all these things that make me really happy. So I think those part and just make you, um, you know, realize that your story and just, like I say, owning it and find parts of life that still bring you so much joy. I, I agree with a lot of that as well. So it's, it's a privilege of perspective and experience. You know, first of all, you have perspective of understanding and realizing and having more empathy for other people. So if you've been through something quite traumatic yourself, it's easier to connect with other people who are struggling with something. It doesn't need to be the same because you have felt a certain level of, of pain and challenges, which just makes you probably, I, I feel that you see it more. You have a little bit higher tolerance for other people in their struggles and a little bit higher understanding to be able to put yourself a little bit in their shoes. And then of course, in general, the, the privilege of having the experience to know that when a new challenge is coming, you have been through something before, so you trust yourself to be able to deal with it. Because, of course, there, there's a lot of people talking about the younger generation now, and a lot of people talking about and discussing if the younger generation are prepared for what is to come and what is here, right? Because our parents have done or worked so hard to remove us from trauma and remove us from challenges so that we would get a better life because their experience of life was that too many challenges isn't good right so kind of the pillars of uh, modern day countries so in that for me it's not so interesting to talk, talk about if we are you know prepared or not or if we're weaker or stronger than the previous generation for me it's, it's, it's not a relevant conversation but we are different because we have been raised for a different, in a different way, and we have learned different things. And the beauty of, of being through something traumatic and having experience of dealing with that is that you are now a little bit richer prepared for life because life is not going to be this plain, beautiful, straight, narrow road, right? It's going to be quite uh, bumpy and for some people more bumpy than others, but still, it's going to be bumps there along the way. So it makes me call more comfortable in facing life and less stressed when challenging situations are coming. For example, COVID, you know, with all the things I've been through, uh, living in, you know, in difficult war contexts and working for doctors without borders, living abroad, uh, living alone away from my family for a very long time in many countries, all of those things made it much easier for me to, to readjust quickly in, in COVID without feeling potentially similar stress as a lot of other people who maybe this was the first time they were away from their family or, or things like that. And um, the other part is, of course, I think in general that have going through something traumatic is also a big part of your identity, but not your entire identity. Like I said, it's part of who made you. But of course, uh, DNA and environment still plays a role. I just believe it's a smaller role than what we potentially say to ourselves, which makes us more similar than, uh, than different. But the, where I have seen that it, it's potentially been problematic is for people who have been identified with just one thing. You know, 9-11 uh, being an example, uh, Utøya in Norway, the, you know, the, the terror attack in Norway. Uh, because if it's just one thing and you might have made a career, maybe you made a book. You know, we have interviewed people as well who made a book out of their story or their trauma. After some years, 
that might be difficult for them because the only thing they're recognized for is being a victim or being a survivor, which potentially after, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, if you're not working with this anymore, this might be, you know, uh, stressful. It's a similar way as a, as a celebrity, celebrity, sorry, celebrity who, uh, you know, stopped playing football or stopped singing or something uh, without other comparison, but it's similar. If your identity is locked to something you're not anymore, that is of course challenging. But as long as you, you can then reshape your identity, I think it will still be, um, still be a, a big asset. And of course, for some people, it, like for example, for, for you, Kiki, I, I don't know fully the extent of your injuries, but for some of the people we have interviewed that has physically visible in, uh, injuries, like for example, sitting in a wheelchair or, or something like that, then of course, it's more heavy because you can never get a rest from it. You know, for me, I can perfectly walk in the streets of Oslo without being recognized as the as the guy who at one point was planned my own suicide, right? Because the not everybody knows, and you can't see it; it doesn't say anywhere. So for me, that's that. I think that's useful, and I I have big respect for people who have to face that they carry visible uh, kind of evidence of uh, that part of their identity everywhere, because I I believe. As far as I understand in the interviews that I've done with people, and Kiki can, can comment some extra on that, I think that's a, a little bit of an extra burden that uh, that takes extra experience and extra courage to, to stand in. Jimmy, you've been touching upon a quite important topic. Um, it's also about preparing future generations and then basically how can we, we bring the power of sharing stories to future generations in a, in a better way. And I think that's also very interestingly linked to what I really liked about Alyssa's poem, who, which was talking a lot about representation. And I think so. So I would add that part a little bit to the question. But it's about how can we prepare children and next generations to speak up more about mental health and sharing their stories? And should it be taught in school? Question from Karima. I can share a little bit about this. Based on my experience, just uh, work with um, children, um, at least who are impacted by a uh, history of homelessness, substance use, and mental health, uh, my current role. And I think uh, oftentimes it's really just a consistently talking to them dumb about the little things that in their daily life. So it's not like, you know, it doesn't have to be a big topic or anything. If something like, you know, they had a bad day at school or something. You're like, tell me what's what happened. Tell me what's going on. Tell me how did that make you feel? It's about the simple every day. Then every day they have the courage to tell you without you even ask first. And I think that's really important because kids oftentimes at a young age, especially elementary school and up, they're still trying to process and find a language to describe how they feel. And that's why you see kids draw a lot, they play a lot, because play is the language of, inter you know, of how they express how they feel. So just to, you know, play with them and let them first guide them with the questions, you know, like, um, tell me your day, tell me what did that make you feel? Things like that every day consistently will help give them the courage to finally just slowly open up when they have a hard time. And they know that they can come to you to, uh, to talk about those things. But it has to be a consistent act of showing up for them in that way, so they know that you consistently can be there for them. Um, doesn't have, like I say, it doesn't have to be big topics. It's minor, small things, but they know that they can rely on you when those mo big moments come. Um, I think those things are just teaching kids the skills, the language, and the way the questions they can ask and how they can explain themselves to you or share their emotions. I almost have too much thoughts on this. <laughs> That's a problem of inviting people who, you know, live through this, uh, these topics. Uh, thank you for the question from, from the audience. Uh, one of the, the main things that I think is important. Number one is emotional language, emotional vocabulary. When I was 13 years old, if you had put me in front of the best psychologist in the world, I wouldn't have been able to tell that type, that person or that person wouldn't have been able to get out of me what was going on inside emotionally because I had no vocabulary at all. 
I could explain all the things, you know, alcohol problems with my dad, bullied at school, I could, you know, mom sick. I could have explained all those things, but I couldn't have told you what was going on inside. So if I have had the words, and I've said this many times, I probably would have never ended up in, in the situation where I was planning to, to end my life. So that is number one. If we can do that, I believe that the future generation will be much more prepared for facing life and mental health will dramatically go down when it comes to uh, the illness part. And then, of course, now we're not talking about diagnosis that you're born with. We're talking about depression and anxiety, the two biggest ones, and burnout and loneliness, you know, things that come and go in life. And also how to live with diagnoses that you're born with. I have ADHD. Obviously, most people are born with that, and you live with it for the rest of your life. At least that's the, that's the theory of it. So also learning how to live with something, a diagnosis or a trauma for that matter, I think would be much easier if you have an emotional vocabulary that is similar to the normal vocabulary we have. So it should be a given that should this should be taught in school. And then <clears throat> the other element for me that I see, it kind of reflects the entire community and society is that we're becoming more polarized, we're becoming more black and white. Everything is becoming more black and white. I see that as very, very dangerous. Saying that you're sick or that you're healthy or these kinds of narratives, again, has never really helped anyone to get anywhere. Because now, again, we're saying all oh, the younger generation, they, they are much weaker. You know, you can see all of them are talking about social anxiety, but uh, what they're really struggling with is the normal things we dealt with when we were younger, you know typical narrative that could be put out there but then again i've always said uh, to a lot of politicians uh, around as well i said you think the my parents would have cared if i had clinical depression or not if i had committed suicide don't really think so so to say that and make that black and white narrative of sick or healthy is not good because it will hinder openness and storytelling so instead let's teach our children about life and the spectrum of mental health in the same way as physical health you can have the flu or you can have cancer you know and it's still a physical health problem and one of them is just a normal part of life it comes and goes most likely every year and sometimes it's worse like COVID, and sometimes it's just normal right and some people will get more serious illnesses and the same way in mental health, sometimes you face bullying, sometimes you face identity elements, uh, sometimes you feel like you hate yourself, you don't like what you see, you don't like what you feel. And that is a normal part of life, but we need to teach them elements to be able to stand in that and deal with that and communicate that. If they do, they will just go back slowly to normal and it will never develop into a depression, for example, or a social anxiety that would then potentially require professional follow-up and help. So <clears throat> I think that's kind of the two main things. And it also goes for coping mechanism. We're very quickly, I was at an event yesterday where they talked about uh, positive and negative coping mechanisms. For me, is also very difficult things to say. It's dangerous to tell kids that something is a negative coping mechanism. Because if someone wants to drink alcohol or take drugs for two years just to exist and not go and commit suicide because the trauma and the something they're going through is so heavy, and then after that be ready to start doing you know, coping mechanisms that don't have negative consequences, then who is to say that that is not necessary? Right. So for me, it's more useful to say coping mechanisms with positive and negative consequences. But they're all just coping mechanisms. So when I didn't tell anything to anyone and I was quite destructive in my mindset and also my actions, it was quite a needed coping mechanism at the time. And I have forgiven myself for choosing that because... What else was my options? I didn't have, I didn't know about the other ones. I had, didn't have knowledge, didn't have emotional language. So who am I to judge myself, right? So if we teach these things to the new generation, I think they will be much more open as well if they slide into, for example, drug abuse because they don't feel so ashamed. Because if you're ashamed about, first of all, your trauma, 
Second of all, how are you coping with it? How on planet Earth do you expect people to talk about it? Not going to happen. So let's make this a more open landscape where they feel comfortable communicating, even if they don't have the perfect words in the perfectionist world that we're living in. Then I think we're going to get somewhere in the, the new generation. And, and they have the opportunity, but we, as the generation above them, the ones that will make the new narratives for, you know, Department of Education that will make the new curriculum. They, we can't wait for them to do it. We have to do and give them what we didn't have. And they will have to embrace it and use it and learn from it and hopefully become a generation that much more uh, emotionally, uh, you know, sustainable than we were when we were raised, I think. And I think another really powerful aspect is also really just this aspect of feeling represented in someone else who has been already sharing their story. And I think that's one one thing that both of you are, are doing extremely important uh, important work on, and that I think is such an such an important part of, of creating a better better narrative and a, a better culture also of, of openly sharing in the future. Um, we have another question from Lennis, uh, which is about what are the tools you have used to create awareness and the courage to understand your humanity that goes beyond talking about it? It's an interesting question. Who wants to start? <laughs> we can mix it up a little. I can, <laughs> I can try to be shorter and I can start so Kiki can think a little. I had the advantage of thinking for uh, all the sessions now. Uh, one of the most useful tools that I used that a mentor, uh, quite random mentor in that sense, helped me with that took me into one of the biggest growth moments that I've had in my life was the ability to look at all of the big decisions that I had made in life. And he told me to go back and write them down, all of them. And all of us have big decisions, right? Why did you choose that college? Why did you move to that city? Why did you choose that job, that profession, that education? things like that, but also other private and big decisions. And he told me that evaluate what other options you had at the time and try to connect with why you made the decision you did. And then you go even deeper and think, how is that connected to your traumatic experiences and what shaped you? And what I found out that I'm talking about today, and it sounds like I'm like super reflected, you know, I had no idea about this when I was younger. So this now I'm saying because I discovered this and that was, I was always choosing the most difficult option because I had an immense need to prove myself good enough because I literally didn't think I was. And I thought that the only way that I could prove myself being worthy as a human being was to perform and get good results. So obviously you choose the toughest option, right? Because if you can manage the toughest option, now your father will recognize you. Now the bullies will stop bullying you. Now the ones you like will like you back. Now your family will show you attention, right? So when I realized that, finally I took back the power of my own experience and my own subconscious narrative and I moved it into my conscious element. So that's one of the most powerful tools that I've done. Try to explore your own story and ask yourself, what did you learn? For example, simple question from your biggest traumas or why did you uh, make the choices you did? That's another good exercise and see how you can now implement that narrative into your conscious mind. And when you now have new choices, now maybe you will choose different because now you are aware that you kind of want to take the most difficult choice, but maybe the wisest decision and what you really want is maybe the medium option or sometimes even the simple option. So that has been a very useful uh, tool for me. And of course, another natural tool is uh, also to hearing other people's stories helps me to evolve my own emotional language when I hear other people talking about uh, how they have gone through life and quite a curious character as well, obviously being an interviewer in my project. So that, <laughs> that, that's a given, uh, another good tool there. Yeah, um, let me make sure I want us to make sure I understand this correct, understand the questions. Uh, so the questions is about what 
helps me create the awareness and courage to kind of understand who I am, what I'm turned with. So I guess for me, um, since I started when I was young, I um, was very involved in the community, different communities. So uh, for an immigrant community, I jumped to the who are the support groups or the organizations in the community that do the work and support the uh, the um, people like me. And then for the burn community, I'm also part of the international burn organization. So being a different part of community and like Jimmy mentions, sharing space with people who have been through a similar experience kind of helped me understand my own experience and also gave me the courage to pursue whatever it is that I want to pursue. And I think a, a pivotal point for my for me was when I started um, attending college at UC Berkeley and it helped me kind of like form what I want to do and my purpose and my why. And I think that when I asked myself this hard question of would, if I could change anything, would I? And I think like if I could go back and not be burned, if I could go back in time and have both of my parents alive, that was a hard question for me. And I think for me it was telling myself, no, I am okay. Like I'm okay with everything that happened. And I think accepting that past and accepting that I would not change anything that happened to me at all. And I think that's when I really move forward and recognize that this is a life that I am now living the new normal because oftentimes folks um, just in general, we stuck with the past. We wish it never happened or we wish we could go back and change it. And I think we know that time doesn't work like that. Life doesn't work like that, unfortunately. And so for me, uh, you know, just being a part of different communities and also not acknowledging that like I give myself permission to live and move forward. And what does that mean? You know, take go to school. What does that mean? Go towards, um, you know, pursuing higher education, be involved, create my business, right, with Kiki, and help other people find their own ways and heal in their own ways. And I think that's my why. And I, when I find my why, I'm able to really thrive. And I think, like I say, thrive with Kiki. Like, I'm really thriving in a way. And I think for me, when I think of sometimes too, is thrive, right? Thriving, it doesn't mean like you have to be all the way up all the time. It doesn't mean like you always have to keep going up high, but it's also acknowledging the moments when you're down and oh, being okay with that. And it's all ebbs and flow and acknowledging that like, that's my whole humanity right there. Like I am a whole human being and I am not perfect. And that's the perfect part of being me. Uh, so my... I guess that's my way to answer that. I hope that helps, Lennis. <laughs> that was such a powerful and beautiful answer. Thank you so much for that. We have one last question that I don't want to keep uh, short, um, which comes from Place. Um, advice for an introvert who is not feeling comfortable sharing his story and issues. Maybe, Jimmy, you have something short to, to share about that. Yeah, I think... Um... One of the things, again, of the black and white narrative, right, is introvert, extrovert, and also that we have, and the honesty of that created a society that's potentially easier to maneuver as an extrovert, especially in the US, maybe, where, you know, selling yourself is, is kind of an asset. If, if you don't do that, you will struggle more uh, in, in success, what society sees as success anyway, and especially in social media era. So I first... I would want to challenge that a little. What do you mean by being an introvert? And what do you entail in that? Because that label is a very strong label that comes with a lot of judgment and a lot of kind of preconceptions of what that means. But as you said, if, if what you mean in the question is, is first and foremost that you potentially don't feel comfortable with, with sharing, is the first thing, as I said, is that I personally don't believe that everyone is supposed to share things out loud, right? Everyone has that teacher in school that was really brilliant in their subject, but the way they presented it was horrible. You didn't learn anything. So we have different skill sets. So some people is brilliant at writing speeches, right? We know that a lot of the most famous people that have given speeches, presidents and, you know, famous people that are giving good talks, it wasn't written by them. 
it was written by someone else. It goes for songs as well, a lot of artists. So some people are extremely good at putting words and emotions to paper, for example, and that is your art, then maybe that's the art you should go for, and that's how you could share it. And other people would want to use music. Other people would want to use theater. You know, I, I'm going straight after this to a theater and being part of an after talk there where it's a fantastic way of, of expressing emotion as well. So I, I would challenge that a little. And of course, I strongly believe that sharing out loud your version, subjective version of what you've gone through and reflecting upon your own journey is useful, no matter if you're introverted or extroverted. So you just choose your format of how to do that. And I would still challenge everybody to do it to a friend and don't care too much if the words are tricky. And maybe sharing it to a friend would be then through a letter. You know, we interviewed someone but going through something horrible, traumatic. Uh, she had been abused quite heavily by her by her boyfriend. And she couldn't tell her dad because it was too difficult to tell her dad. Uh, so she wrote a letter and she wrote it and gave it to him. And then she came or he came to, he, to her after and talked about it. So that was easier. We have interviewed a lot of people who have written down on paper what they're struggling with to bring to their doctor to be able to be referred to a psychologist because it's too difficult to put to words what they've gone through. And both Kiki and I said it, practice. So we didn't wake up one day like this, right? And uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily stamped as an extrovert either. I've been both in my life. I've been extremely introverted for parts of my life. And I've been extremely extroverted for, for part of my life, you know, for, for a context. And it had a purpose for, for why I chose that uh, path. But if you feel like you identify more with, with other means of sharing, and that's my best uh, thoughts on that. I know uh, just for uh, time purposes, I think I just want to leave with something you can also just talk to yourself. <laughs> you are welcome to, you know, mirror work. I spent majority of my time growing up just talking to myself and, you know, your your mind process things better when you, you know, let them out loud. And to, um, so like Jimmy mentioned, talking out loud, journaling any ways you can, but I know that, you know, many of us have phones and we can just voice record and, to practice and practice and hearing yourself and also seeing how you speak to yourself out loud it's really helpful and just seeing that and naming that like are you you know speaking to yourself in a way that is not maybe not as helpful yourself down naming that and seeing that and I remember growing up my sister is always like why do you always talk to yourself but that really helped me heal and really, you know, all my loved ones know that I talk to myself, but that's also okay. I accepted that and it just helped me process my thoughts so much better. Um, you know, even when I'm simple things silly, but I'm like, if I was my house key, where would it be? <laughs> simple things like if I was, you know, if I'm hungry, what do I need right now? If I'm feeling sad, what is it that I need right now? It's very simple. But think of it as a child. You're a kid. You're tending to your inner child. And what do you need the most? I absolutely love that we started the session with a poem, poem and we ended it on the different ways how you could represent your story. So I think that's a wonderful wrap up of, of this talk. Thank you so much to both of you for your great insights, for your inspiring work. I think there's a lot of things in here that I at least am going to still think about for, for a bit. And I hope it's the same for the audience. And thank you so much for, for joining us today to both of you and also to everyone who listened to, to the talk. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting us and arranging. And thank you for everyone watching as well and for questions. Thank you, everyone. We shared the links to uh, the human aspect and to Kiki's uh, site here in the chat, and we're also going to share them to you afterwards. So please have a look at, at their amazing work and see you all soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>